Good morning, and can I welcome you to this, the seventh meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent? The first item on the agenda is a decision on taking item four, which is the consideration of the committee's annual report in private. Do members agree to take item four in private? Thank you. The second item on the agenda is the consideration of continued petitions. The first petition for consideration is petition 1664 by Harry Hewton on behalf of one kind on greater protection for mountain hares. We last considered this petition in December and agreed to ask the Scottish Government what opportunity there was for members of the public, including the petitioner, to contribute to the development of the new principles of moorland management guidance on sustainable hare management currently being developed. The Scottish Government responded by stating that the Moorland Forum is developing this guidance, which is technical in nature and therefore not suitable for public consultation. The Government highlights, however, that the petitioner can seek membership of this forum if they wish to do so. The written submission also reiterated a point made in previous submissions that an independently led group has been set up to look at the environmental impact of grouse moor management, including mountain hare culls, the findings of which will be reported in spring 2019. Members may also wish to note that Alison Johnson, MSP, recently raised a question during First Minister's questions in relation to the large-scale culling of mountain hares. In response, the First Minister stated that the Government intends to hold meetings with stakeholders to explore the prevention of mass culls of mountain hares, including legislation and a licensing scheme. I wonder if members have any comments on what action we should take. Brian? Um, well, I, th I think that, uh, given Alison Johnson's question, uh, and uh, the government's response and would be real, uh, you know, realistic to to to, to ask the government or wait for the government to come to its conclusions uh, on the, on the back of that because they're already doing a, an investigation. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Michelle. Be useful to get a response from the petitioner in terms of what the government has said, because if the petitioner was happy to seek membership of that forum and work through them, that would probably make best sense. But okay. I think we need to know what the petitioner is thinking at this stage. Yeah. So we haven't had mm -hmm. a written response from the petition, but that's obviously something that we can seek and even just a, um, to see what, how they respond. And we would look for the information perhaps that's been elicited from Alison Johnson's question. Is that so I think we an update on, on what's happened since then. I mean, I, I saw that footage as most people did. It was, it, it was horrible. And uh, I think given that the question was raised at the end of March, it would be Interesting to see what has happened since then. I think we need okay. an update. Is that agreed? Indeed. Okay. Um, if that's agreed, we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1672 by Hugh Patterson on Scottish Law Commission Report on Prescription. At our last consideration of this petition in December, we agreed to ask the Scottish Government for its views on the petition. The Scottish Government's response states that there should be no reform on the issue of negative prescription, highlighting that it is, quote, an essential part of balancing individual interests on the one hand and serving the wider public interest on the other. As such, the 20-year long stop is considered to create, quote, legal certainty, finality and fairness. In response to this point, the petitioner states that he understands the reason for the 20-year cut-off point, but there should be something in place to cover title deed holders if discrepancies are discovered after 20 years. He also highlights that title deed holders are unaware of the 20-year cut-off period. Members will also recall that the committee discussed a potential solution which would inform purchasers immediately at the time of purchasing a property whether a title has been adequately registered. The Scottish Government responded by stating that there is already relevant legislation in place which requires the Keeper of the Register to notify the applicant, quote, so long as it is reasonably practicable to do so. And I wonder if members have any comments. Yeah. Michelle? I, I think I said at the, the last time that we looked at this one that I did have some concerns around the the 20 year cutoff, whilst I accept that it's it's important to have that end point and not leave these things in perpetuity. If you have lived in a house for a long time, it's not just about that point of transfer. It is about, I think the petitioner refers to it, the changes that take place in the way in which, say, computerization of these deeds, etc., occurs and boundaries can move through no fault of, of the landowner. So I think the suggestion was made somewhere here that actually maybe at the point of cutoff, sort of one year prior, that notification was made. And I don't know how practical that is, but I, I still remain slightly uncomfortable about the idea that if you've lived somewhere a long time 
and changes have been made in terms of mapping, etc., that you can find yourself left high and dry with a boundary change with no right of recourse through no fault of your own. Um, so, you know, I, maybe there's something about an awareness thing, you know, if you've lived in a property that it's, it's up to you to check. But I, I just, I'm just slightly left with a, a feeling that there's a missing link here. Um, and I'm not sure we've, I've got, I suppose, an adequate answer to how we protect people at that mm. end point. So I don't know what anybody else on the committee feels. I think it's fairly clear that, that the government are not going to, you know, to, to change um, change the law um, regarding this. But I think it's fair to ask if they would consider an awareness campaign, because if enough people were aware of it, that would, you know, really lessen the problem greatly. Um, and it could just be down to just not being being aware of it. So I think I think it would be reasonable for us. I'd, other than that, I think we've gone as far as we can with it. But I think it's it's fair enough to ask them if they would consider that. Other views. Um, yeah, I would agree with uh, Rona Mackay. I mean, uh, th there is a strong argument, I think, for uh, an awareness scheme uh, of, of the 20-year 20, 20 uh, cut-off period. Clearly, the, the government's no plans to amend uh, the law relating to uh, prescription and limitation, but certainly the, uh, uh, you know, an, an awareness uh, scheme would would um, maybe help to improve the situation a, a little bit, if, if not completely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it would actually because I think the problem with awareness campaigns unless it's a continuous thing you know you highlight it for a short period a few people pick up on it you spend a lot of money on it and actually in the end you don't really change anything because for most people if they check today it doesn't mean in 10 years time they'd be in any better position so uh, I'm not sure in terms of return on investment whether an awareness campaign would really solve the problem if I'm honest um, I think this is more about that closure point. I, I, you know, whether or not sort of 18 months before that 20-year cut-off, there is a, a, the feasibility of somebody being. Who would do that? How would that be triggered? Well, I've no idea. That? This is this is why I'm saying I don't I don't really have the answer. But 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 that triggering of you know of a registration has has sat. Yeah. permanently for a period of time when it I mean computer systems can flag up and send an automatic letter you know it could be programmed in I guess from transfer date you know who's a computer land registration mm. yeah it's a council issue. no it's land registration yeah. it's it's nothing to do with the council mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it would be registers of Scotland yeah, yeah. I, think I wonder it whether it'd be worth I mean I think everybody recognises there needs to be a, a, a a stopping point and therefore you know to have a stopping point that doesn't really stop doesn't work either but to ask the Scottish Government how do they address this question of making sure that people are aware of their rights or the consequences this is something you know the at point of transactions you're made aware of or as you say it can be a long long period after that you know people wouldn't be even thinking about it and maybe asking the Scottish Government if not an awareness campaign what would they would they look at them I mean, and it'd be reasonable at least to test those options with them? I suppose I guess what I'm I'm saying is it would it be feasible for us to write to the land registry office and just say, you know, does your system work in any way that if, if a land registry has not been changed mm -hmm. for a period and it's coming up to that twenty years, say at like twelve months or eighteen it. months before, could an automatic letter be sent to say, mm -hmm. you know, your registration has been in place for you know, 18 and a half years and come 18 months' time, you will have no right of redress should there be any errors and therefore you may wish to check this before that yeah. period. You know, I mean, it just... And, and it doesn't need to be named. It can just be to the owner of and <coughs> sent to the property and then, you know, the onus is on... Yeah. But I think it'd be worth asking that question. Um, okay. And if that, if that is feasible and can be done with... Because, I mean, the number of properties that don't change hands in 20 years now is probably relatively small. Mm -hmm. um, OK, can I th suggest then that we, we, we flag up to Scottish Government this question about an awareness raising scheme? It may be that it's just simply, you know, people are not... If people are not paying attention, then why would, would they be triggered that? But it'd be worth maybe checking with them, but also asking, is it feasible to have the system as you've outlined? Is that agreed? OK, in that case, if we can move on to the next petition for consideration... 
both by James Mackey, which are Petition 1673 on the operation and running of child protection services in Scotland, and Petition 1675 on attendance at children's hearings. We'll ask us out of these petitions at our meeting on the 23rd November, when we agreed to join them together for consideration and agreed to seek a response from the Scottish Government on the action called for in the petitions. Members will note that we have received responses from the Scottish Government and a response from the petitioner. We have also received three other submissions on Petition 1673 from three individuals with an interest in the petition. Members will recall that Petition 1673 in particular sets out issues in relation to a number of elements of child protection and the Government response provides commentary on these points. In addition to addressing the various points of the petition, the Government response also refers to two specific areas of work. These are the reconvening of the Child Protection Systems Review Group in April 2018 and the work being undertaken by the Independent Care Review, chaired by Fiona Duncan. The petitioner's response addresses the points made in the government's response as to the submissions from Maggie Mellon and Gary Clapton. Overall, the view offered by the petitioner and others is that the practical experience of the operation of child protection systems differs from what is envisaged by the regulations and procedures that govern the system. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rona? Um, I mean, I think I said at the time when the petition was bought that it brought that um, I didn't recognise a lot of the um, opinion and, and claims that were in it, um, much as I, I sympathise with the petitioner for having had a bad experience. Um, I think the government's response is, is comprehensive, and I, I, I really don't, um, I don't see any justification for keeping this petition open. To be quite honest, I think there's the reviews going on, um, and you know it's current. Um, it's, it's always under scrutiny. The children's hearing system is always being looked at, so I, I really can't see any, uh, any further, any, anywhere we can go with this, and I'd be, I'd be in favour of closing it. Well, be reminded that the two petitions there, so perhaps uh -huh. specifically on it, attendance at children's hearings. Yes. Is that? I mean, I think um, I think there's an um, an important issue about the purpose of children's hearings in yes. terms of making sure that yeah. the young person is at the centre of consideration. So, yeah. um, that may be one that uh -huh. looks as if we've, we've had a reasonable um, response. I think from yeah. the government. I suppose the yeah. different question really is there have been some questions flung up by. 1673 mm -hmm. on the way in which, um, you know, I, I suppose one of the arguments is that if you, instead of responding to a crisis in and bringing a child into care, what supports are we putting in at an earlier stage, which is a different argument. It's what's round about the hearing system rather than simply the hearing itself. Uh -huh. yeah. And I wondered if it might be worth exploring that a bit. Brian? No, I, I, I agree. I think, you know, that. I actually agree, agree with Tony McKay. I think a lot of the a lot of what we heard I don't recognise, but uh, the, the petitioner um, in raising this uh, uh, continues to keep um, uh, child protection at the at the forefront. Um, but I also I agree with, uh, with with you, um, um, and and that and that, that uh, there, there is some some there's some issues there that I think they still have to be addressed it's around around that that early intervention. And, uh, and I don't think it would do any harm to continue to, uh, to, f to flag that and to continue to investigate that. Michelle? Yeah, I mean, whilst I think the problem with, with the child protection system is it, it is very people-based, so it can, there some, can be some really good positive experiences, but there can also be some very negative experiences. Um, it, it is a complicated and difficult process. It's very emotional. And getting it right is extremely difficult. Um, I think that the review that um, Fiona Duncan is leading on is going to be really important mm -hmm. in all of this. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I've already sat down and talked to them about some of the work that's being done. And I think it may well have a big impact on our systems and particularly our child protection system. So I think there is a bit of a wait and see in this in terms of what comes out of that. And so I guess, the p the petitions I don't think can be dismissed because there is some basis for concern, and it, and that same concern runs through the reason why there is being there is a review. Um, but I do think we have to let the review take place. I do think we have to let the processes that are already in hand go through, 
and then maybe come back and see whether that's answered some of the questions. Certainly, um, the Education Committee, on which I sit, took evidence from Fiona Duncan, and there were a, num a couple of care experienced young people there as well. It was very impressive and very thought provoking because it didn't feel, it's certainly far from feeling like we have to go through this process. It was very genuine engagement with people who are in um, the care system. Equally, the Education Committee has had a watching brief on the hearing system, um, in fact, produced a report very recently. I suppose, um, in terms of dealing with, my own view would be that I think the one on the, on the importance of a child, young person taking part, I think that petition, we could probably close because we've got an answer in that. Um, but I am interested in this argument. I think the, the debate that's going on is whether the hearing system or the desire to bring young people into care is, or, so so that it, so a sense that the system wants to bring ch children into care and they have a very bad experience, we need to rethink that. I'm not sure if I agree with that, but that's the argument. And the argument, and as a consequence, we're not investing enough in supporting families who might be in crisis. We, we take the option of taking the child into care. I'm not sure if that's what's happening, but I think that is the kind of balance of argument. And I think it might be interesting to get views on that from sort of the key organisations that are involved. I mean, I think the petitioner has, um, it may be, you know, direct experience that has been very poor, but whether you can extrapolate from that, or they feel it's been very poor, that this is the mindset of everybody's engaged in the system, I'm not sure if that's true. But it would be worth maybe asking um, some of the organisations that are involved. Michelle? I think also, um, because this is quite a, a complicated area, it also spreads wider, perhaps than this, it, it spreads into what we're doing with around vulnerable twos in, in early years and all. So I think there's a big conversation about how we support families and how we prevent them ending up in the hearing system, ending up in, in child care, sorry, child protection. A massive issue, but in terms of the petition, I think the bit that we would want to look at is whether we're inappropriately bringing children into care because there's not enough support or because there is a mindset which says this is the solution. So I wonder if we could maybe contact the reporters themselves, the Association of Direct Social Work and perhaps some of the other organisations that are involved in this field. Yeah, mm -hmm. is that agreed? But and would I be right in thinking that we're content to close Petition 1675 um, under Rules 15.7 of Standing Orders and I think we've got the government's view on that, and there's enough protections within that from our point of view. If that's agreed, then we can move on to petition 1674. Um, the next petition for consideration is petition 1674 by Ellie Stirling on managing the cat population in Scotland. At uh, first consideration of this petition, we agreed to seek the views of the Scottish Government, um, animal welfare charities and veterinary bodies. The petition calls for a review of the Code of Practice under the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011 to make neutering, microchipping and registration of owned domestic cats compulsory. In her submission, the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform notes that any change to the Code of Practice does not change the law. She does, however, indicate that she will ask the Non-Native Species Action Group to explore this issue, adding that the group liaises closely with representatives of the Scottish Wild Cat Action Plan. The submissions from animal charities and veterinary bodies indicate an acknowledgement of the issue raised by the petition, but do not consider that microchipping and neutering of cats should be compulsory. To support their position, they cite issues of enforcement, concerns about unintended consequence, such as an increase in cats and kittens being abandoned, and a lack of evidence to support the action called for in the petition. Members will note, however, that all of the agencies who responded have indicated a willingness to work together to deliver and promote an effective public awareness campaign on responsible cat ownership. The petitioner argues that an assertive approach is required in relation to neutering cats and encouraging responsible cat ownership. She suggests some stakeholders the committee might contact to address the issue from a conservation perspective. In her written submissions to the committee, the petitioner has also highlighted measures implemented elsewhere in Europe and beyond. In particular, she refers to the model that has recently been adopted in Belgium and suggests that it would be helpful to learn from their experience. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Michelle? I have to be honest, um, I, I, this was quite a surprising petition because I didn't actually 
know about issues with cats, um, but it, it was thoughtful. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps we should should do as, as suggested within our papers and, and write to the organisations of the Scottish Wild Cat Action Plan to invite their views. And, and, you know, I think it would be interesting to know whether this is this is as big a problem as, as suggested in this petition. Um, so I think, you know, you know, looking at the conservation issues, finding out what, what the thinking is. Um, and she suggested we write to Professor Anne Meredith, and I think that's probably worthwhile to do. And, uh, and then obviously seek the update from the Scottish Government on its five-year Scottish Wildcat Action Programme and establish whether it will publish any interim findings. Um, so I think the suggestions that have been made in our papers are, are good and we should follow through on that. Okay. Any other comments? Brian? Scottish government quite clearly don't they don't think the the, uh, the petitioner or chipping uh, chipping and neutering is, is uh, the way forward. But I'd be I think I'm quite interested to see you know explore what the unintended consequence exactly what the unintended consequences are going to be because I I can't quite see see that so it's certainly worth worth exploring a little bit further as as, as Michelle Bar 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 yeah. said. Angus, yeah, um, thanks, Camille. Yeah, following on from um, Brian Whittle's comments, I think it's. Uh, worth highlighting a salient point that the Scottish SPCA uh, submitted, um, in which they, uh, they consider the pro proposal to make neutering legally compulsory to protect the Scottish wildcat does not make sense, in quotes, um, <clears throat> as cats in the central belt and cities do not pose a threat to Scottish wildcats. Um, so, you know, th there's, there's clearly an issue there. Uh, although they are, uh, the SSPCA are clearly confirming their support for vaccination, microchipping and, and neutering um, and, and highlight that there's certainly more public education required in that area. But yeah, I would agree that um, we should uh, cont contact the uh, partner organisations, the Scottish Wildlife Action Plan, uh, to seek their views mm -hmm. further. I, mean, I suppose I was quite struck by it's one of these things where there's not an obvious answer and there's a genuine argument to be made on both sides. Sometimes if there's a right and a wrong, you can identify it quite quickly. And I'm, I'm not an expert in this by any stretch of the imagination, but it feels that we're more um, prescriptive of what we expect of dog owners than cat owners. I don't know if that's something very controversial to say, but do not, dogs not have to be microchipped? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so I just I think we'd like to explore it. If we f well, my feeling, I think, I think the committee is reflecting is that there is something here and there's something interesting. And it may not be that the, the solution is what the, the petitioner ex, um, has asked for, but I think we'd be quite yeah. interested. Yeah. And perhaps the wildlife, um, the wildcat issue is really not something in the central belt, but whether there are other issues in the central belt that affect cats and, and so on, I think it would just be worthwhile looking at that further. So I think if we'd agreed on the proposals that have been identified and obviously um, the petitioner will have the opportunity to make a further submission once we have had a response from the folk that we're seeking information from. So if that's agreed, we can move on to the next petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1676 by Tony Rosser. The petition calls for a review of the Land Registration Etc. Scotland Act 2012, in particular with regard to the cadastral map and the provision of supporting materials. Following our initial consideration of this petition, the committee wrote to the Scottish Government and Registers of Scotland. In its submission, the Scottish Government indicates that it has no current plans to review the use of the cadastral map. It states that powers are available to ministers under the Act to make an order to change the mapping system where there was sufficient evidence there was a better alternative. It indicates it's not aware of a better alternative. The Keepers of the Registers of Scotland confirms that it has, quote, no capacity issues under the current system, but considers that it would be impractical and extremely resource intensive for it to take its own view on the accuracy of updated information provided by the Ordnance Survey. In response, the petitioner argues that under the current system, the potential for errors to be made remains, with no opportunity for owners to approve the changes. In response to the views presented by the Scottish Government and Registers of Scotland in relation to costs and resources, the petitioner states that significant costs and delays are borne by property owners at present and suggests that these should be borne by the Scottish Government and Registers of Scotland. In relation to the provision of supporting materials, the Scottish Government notes that the Act requires solicitors to take reasonable care to ensure all information is accurate and up to date, but states that this is an operational matter for Registers of Scotland. 
The Keeper indicates that it does not consider it necessary to ask solicitors to provide supporting materials such as death certificates, as the solicitors are, quote, under a professional duty to act in the best interests of their clients. The petitioner reiterates his position that provision of supporting materials, quotes, negates the possibility of error and in extreme cases could prevent fraud. The Act will be included in the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee's work on post-legislative scrutiny. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Michelle? I think given that the Act is going to be reviewed by the Post-Scrutiny and Audit Committee, um, would it not be sensible to just send it to them to look at as part of their work? That would seem sensible. Yeah. Other views? <laughs> I agree with Michelle, yeah. Um, yeah. I think, again, this is clearly an issue that um, has concerned the petitioner greatly, and I think if, if he's wanting a review of the Act, then certainly this is the, the you know, the this post-legislative scrutiny is part of the, the programme um, of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee, and if we can um, refer it formally to them, then they would include that in their in their work if that's agreed. Um, and obviously, um, we would want to thank the petitioner um, for presenting the petition to us, and obviously they will have the opportunity to follow the considerations of the, the committee in that regard. Okay. If we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1677, by Dr Sarah Glynn, on behalf of the Scottish Unemployed Workers Network, on making more money available to mitigate welfare cuts. We first considered this petition in February when we agreed to invite the Scottish Government to address three points. To what extent it had considered mitigating welfare cuts as part of its budget consideration, whether it had considered redirecting expenditure to enable more funding to be made available for mitigation, whether it had considered increasing the Scottish Welfare Fund and the support available to help people access their benefits. The Scottish Government's submission to set an is set in the context of the UK Government's welfare reforms, which it says will result in a reduction of approximately £4 billion in welfare spend by 2020-21. It reiterates its ongoing commitment to continue to mitigate alongside the work on delivery of devolved benefits devolved under the Scotland Act 2016 and lists the areas it has allocated over £1 million to for 2018-19. It also identifies a range of other policies and measures, including the Best Start Grant, Carers Allowance and others as identified in the Clark's note. The petitioners refer to this as simply a reiteration of what the Scottish Government has already announced or is already doing. They argue that the Government's submission does not address their concerns about, among other things, discretionary housing payments, child benefits, a living wage for carers and the Scottish Welfare Fund. The Scottish Government states that it considers the Scottish Welfare Fund to be a vital lifeline. The petitioners refer to the UK Government's recent reversal of its policy on the provision of housing subsidy to 18 to 21 year olds on universal credit. They suggest that any money in the Scottish Government had set aside within the Scottish Welfare Fund to budget for support in this area can be used for other welfare mitigation and seeks confirmation from the UK from the Scottish Government sorry, that it will keep this money for welfare and ask what other help it plans to give. Uh, members may also be aware that the Social Security Committee is expected to undertake some inquiry work on the Scottish Welfare Fund from 17th of May. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, I, th I think the fact that the, the Social Security Committee are about to undertake some of this work it would seem logical to me that we feed uh, the petitioners' um, um, thoughts in, in, into that particular, uh, that particular um, inquiry. Um, I would quite like to see the, uh, uh, this, this petition referred to the Social Security Commission. Okay. Other views? Angus? Yeah, I would uh, agree, Convener. Um, I think given that the Social Security Committee's um, work on this is imminent, um, we should send it to them directly uh, to, to uh, help with their um, deliberations. Angus and, and uh, Brian, I think it's it's a good fit for the Social Security Committee and it's quite timely that they're going to be doing their inquiries, so mm -hmm. I think we should send it to them. I certainly think one of the things I was interested in is if there's money being set aside, as is highlighted, as I've already said, to mitigate a policy around not uh, giving housing support to 18 to 21-year-olds, and that has changed. 
will will the Scottish Government not um, direct that money elsewhere, but maintain it with inside the welfare budget? And I think that would be quite an interesting thing. We can't direct them on what they would look at, but I think we'd want to flag that up to them, that that was a, a particular issue. Um, and whether the, the Scottish Welfare Fund itself, um, you know, what, what is the review of it, the size of it? I mean, in relation to the, maybe the many calls upon it, but I think when I, I think this I'm sensing from the committee, we recognise there are big issues here on either side of the argument about whether the UK government has taken the right approach or the Scottish government is doing enough to mitigate against it. But I think that question of how that budget is then spent, what size it is, is something the Social Security Committee is looking at. Shall be interesting to ask the question: what they're going to do with that that money that was uh, that was already allocated and now not required would be quite interesting to mm -hmm. find out what they're going to do with that. I think we can include that in, in our correspondence. So we could decide not to refer it and get that question answered, but I suspect if, if the, the Social Security Committee is doing this work now, it would be helpful to feed in the views of the petitioner, what, you know, what's been provided to us already, and those questions that have been prompted by it, if that's agreed. Okay, in that case, we're agreeing to refer the petition to the Social Security Committee for consideration of part of its inquiry into the Scottish Welfare Fund and as part of its wider work on managing the implementation of the Scotland Act. And if I can suspend briefly before the next item. back to order and we're moving on to our third agent item um, today which is the consideration of new petitions. So the next petition for consideration today is petition 1689 by Jim Clark on hepatitis C treatment targets in Scotland. We will take evidence this morning from the petitioner and Charles Gore who is chief executive of the hepatitis C trust. Can I welcome you to the meeting this morning and can I invite you to make a short opening statement of up to five minutes after which members after which members of the committee will have an opportunity to ask some questions. So welcome and I can hand over to you. Right, uh, my name's Jim, as I've said. Uh, I'm a former patient. Uh, previous, I was diagnosed with hepatitis C about 10 years ago and I got rid of it in 2013. Uh, it's made a, a massive positive impact on my life, getting rid of the, the disease. And I feel that if we can do that for other people, it's the humanitarian thing to do, really. Uh, I was on long-term sick for a period of about 10 years, uh, in which time I was misdiagnosed a few times. And it's, it's been since, since getting rid of the virus, I've got myself back into employment. It's taken a, a, a while, but um, I'm off benefits now and working. And I just feel that if we can make such a positive impact in my life, we should do it for everyone that, that's affected. And I, I don't feel that putting a, a limit on the numbers is the way to go, really. I feel that the longer someone's infected for, the more chance there is of passing on the infection. And as I said, it's financial costs is, are quite expensive as well. It's the cost to the welfare bill uh, and things like that. So the, the money that the NHS spend will actually save in other areas quite a lot. 
and send Mr Gore at this point. Uh, yes, I, I'd like to say thank you, um, Chair. Um, I'd like to say that the Hepatitis C Trust very strongly supports um, Jim's petition here. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo what he says about the tremendous potential benefits to individuals. Um, it so happened I also had hepatitis C, and if I had not been treated since I had cirrhosis at the time of getting treatment, I could well be dead by now or have had a, a liver transplant. Um, and also, one of the things from the individual point of view is that, as you know, hepatitis C disproportionately affects marginalized groups, whether these are people who inject drugs, people in prison, certain uh, migrant communities from highly endemic countries, uh, the homeless. So addressing hepatitis C is actually one of the health interventions that will help uh, address inequalities. But it is also a public health issue here. Uh, as Jim said, um, the longer someone is left with living with the virus, the more likely they are to transmit it to other people. And this, of course, particularly applies to people who inject drugs, which is where a lot of the transmission is happening. And if we don't get out and treat them, we will have this continuing uh, new infection. And clearly, the sooner, from a public health point of view, we eliminate hepatitis C, the sooner we get all the benefits of the, the long-term care that people don't need. And the third point, really, is that um, up until the end of last year, I was uh, president of the World Hepatitis Alliance, and I spent a lot of time going around the world lauding the Scottish approach to hepatitis C. Scotland has been an absolute leader in this. And I don't think there are too many health areas where we have been. And it's been really wonderful for me to be able to hold Scotland up. The World Health Organization has recognized that the Scottish Action Plan was really a masterpiece, and now the, the uh, sexual health and bloodborne virus framework. And I would like to see us continue with that. And I just feel at the moment what we're doing is stepping back a little bit and going, well, let's try and do the minimum we can do and not be aspirational about this. And this petition is not calling for the government to increase the minimum targets, in other words, force the health boards to spend more money. It's saying, please also have aspirational targets. Let's really try and eliminate this. And Tayside have said that they can do it locally in five years. Why can't we do it in the rest of Scotland? Because they are being aspirational, and the rest of Scotland at the moment is not. Thank you. Thank you very much and can I thank you both in particular petitioner I think for bringing his own direct experience which I think always helps in informing our considerations. Can I maybe start off, is it one of the matters discussed in your petition is the cost of treatment? I mean, wonder if you can clarify what the estimated figure is for treating each individual um, and sort of indicate what factors might contribute to that number varying between people receiving treatment. For example, a treatment cost reduced if treatment is commenced as early as possible. Um, after infection occurs? Um, so um, the price of the drugs is commercial in confidence, so I'm afraid I, I can't comment on that because I don't know. Um, however, uh, we can estimate that it's £10,000 or less. Uh, certainly in England, some of the treatments are down to uh, 5,000 pounds and may go less than that. Um, these, by the way, are treatments that were considered cost-effective at somewhere between 30 and 35,000 pounds. So we're now talking about things that are absolutely cost-saving, which is clearly where you should invest money from a rational point of view. You, you spend money on the cost-saving things first and then work your way down uh, the increasingly less cost-effective things. Um, in terms of treating early, um, some of the drugs require shorter courses of treatment the sooner you do it. As people advance towards cirrhosis, you may need longer courses of treatment, so it is cheaper to treat people early. Quite apart from the fact that if somebody infects somebody else, that's a whole other course of treatment that you're going to have to pay for. 
Did that answer your question? Yeah, I wondered whether, um, is there evidence that as the price of the drugs has gone down, the number of people are treated has gone up? Or is there a suggestion, I think we've got it in our papers, that perhaps what's happened is um, you continue to treat the number that are expected to, and the money that's saved from that because the drugs have been cheaper and not then been invested in aspirational targets around Hep C, but have been used for other things? Uh, that's exactly right, because the, the fall in the price of drugs has been very steep. And although the minimum targets have increased, they haven't increased as much as the fall in the price of a drug. So um, it was estimated that a, a, a treatment in this year, which has actually been set at 2,000, if that was 3,000, that would be still cost less than the 1,800 treated uh, last year and the year before. So that's exactly what appears to be happening. Some health boards are... If they save money, they are treating more people, but the majority of them, eight, are not. They are pocketing the savings. And in at least two of the other four, they are under pressure to pocket those savings. Um, completely understand the financial pressures of the, the system, but this is one of these very, very few areas where you can do something and then it's done. You're not talking about doing it year after year after year indefinitely. Okay, thanks very much for that, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, uh, Convener. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Charles. Um, in your petition, you re refer to the report published by the Hepatitis C Trust in January uh, this year, which, uh, and I quote, found that some clinicians were being asked to slow down the numbers of patients being treated in order to treat patients in line with targets rather than in line with the allocated budget, end quote. Um, so I'd be keen to, uh, to know what the, the current position is in different parts of the country in relation to the prevalence of uh, hepatitis C and in any variation to approaches uh, or in approaches to treatment. Um, do you have any information on such differences? Don't leave it. Okay. Um, uh, yes, I mean, so Tayside is a standout example where they are um, reinvesting everything from the savings into treating more people and very uh, aggressively going out and finding people because this is one of the issues. Um, there was a, a group of people who knew they were infected, were waiting for treatment, and those have largely been treated in lots of areas. There's a second group of people who are diagnosed but have somehow fallen out of the care pathway. And then there's the undiagnosed group. And both these latter two need a really proactive approach to re-engage the first and diagnose the second. And that is exactly what Tayside have done. And they have particularly concentrated on their uh, injecting drug user population uh, they set up a, a, an extremely good system around their needle exchanges where they use that to engage people, get them tested, and then present them for treatment. And they are at the moment trying to show that if you treat injecting drug users, the prevalence will fall because you will stop the new infections. And then there are other parts of the country, and I don't wish to name and shame anyone but there are other parts of the country where clearly um, they are literally hitting the target and stopping okay it would be good if maybe if you could sh name and shame privately with us yeah. fine <laughs> <laughs> to do just, that just so that we have uh, we, we have the figures then um, but i'm sure a uh, tayside nhs will be pleased to to get some praise this week uh, given the the issues that have that we've seen Okay, thanks, Convener. Okay, uh, Rona Mackay. Thanks, Convener. Good morning, Charles. Good morning, Jim. Um, your petition notes that hepatitis C is preventable, treatable and curable for the vast majority of people, which is great news. And it goes on to state that the new, new treatments are now available with short treatment durations, limited side effects and cure rates upwards of 95%. Can you clarify whether these new treatments are available as standard? Is that is that just now how it's, how it's happening? Or is it still a postcode lottery, as you know you may have said earlier? Um, you know, if if someone presents now with with a, a diagnosis, is will they be 
routinely given the new treatment. It should be, yes. In most right. cases, I would think, yeah. The, but the issue is, if they're in a, a part of the country where there is a waiting list, uh, which there certainly has been, for example, in GGC, then uh, it might be, well, we'll treat you. And certainly the new drugs are, are all being used, but it's, it would be like, you may have to come back in six months. The issue with that is that you may not be in touch with them for six months. Some of the people infected with hepatitis C are from groups who are not necessarily or are, uh, are fairly randomly in touch with services. So, for example, if you have somebody who comes into a drug service, the ideal would be as soon as they come into the service, you test them and start them on treatment. Not say to them, come back in six months when who knows where they'll be. Um, Can you just clarify that? I mean, just from my own understanding, um, why would, if you if you present, and why would somebody say to you, come back in six months? Is, is the drug not available or, or just not enough people to treat the person? Or It's really the, the cost, effectively. Cost. They're having a waiting list of... If you have uh, only a certain number you can treat in a year, you are going to typically try and treat the people who um, have the most need first, which will be people with cirrhosis, there may be other issues, but um, or at least advanced fibrosis. So if somebody, say a young drug user presents, um, you may be saying to them, I'm sorry, um, we don't have the capacity to treat you at the moment within our, our budget. Um, we need to make sure that we've treated, I've got 30 people on my waiting list that I'm, I'm treating now first. So that's the, okay. that's the issue. Yeah. There have been cases where people have been told that they're not actually ill enough to come, you know, to come back when you feel worse, basically, which is, you know, that... Happening quite widespread. It's, it's not happening so much now, but no. in, in the past that was the case. In the past, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. We, Thank we you. We were actually had campaigns to to try and get test more people, get them diagnosed, and get them into treatment. And for some of them, this was what they were told. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Brian Quittle. Thank you. Good morning. You'll obviously be aware there was a debate in Parliament <laughs> yesterday, which I was. Very fortunate to take part in. Um, I think, you know, in, in that debate and, and in the, the petition yourself, the, the petition states there's a number of people who may be unaware uh, that they have hepatitis C and T. I think it's in, in the region of 40, 45 percent of cases that they believe there's, that there's still to be uh, still to be diagnosed. And as part of trying to raise that awareness and, and knowledge of hepatitis C, perhaps you could explain the symptoms or not that, that, that might indicate that they have hepatitis C? Uh, the symptoms are, are very varied mm. uh, from person to person, really. Uh, in the past, they were, they've were they been quite commonly misdiagnosed as ME, which was yuppie flu. You know, that's what I was told I had. Uh, so the, the, the symptoms of that are extreme fatigue, depression, uh, lack of motivation. Uh, really, that's uh, pains, pains in the, the back and side. Uh, that, those are the main ones. So they, don't, they, don't really, they don't really manifest themselves till probably they start to damage the liver. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say that it's when when it starts to, to work on the liver is when it. But the liver does that many functions, you know. It serves that many functions. It's it's quite difficult to say where it actually starts having an effect. You know, what I mean, there's the extra hepatic illnesses that go along with it. So the longer you have hepatitis. The, the more chance there is that you'll develop these extra hepatic illnesses, which can be rheumatoid arthritis, uh, vasculitis, uh, car cardiac problems. There's, there's quite because the liver affects the blood, uh, so it has knock-on effects to other parts of the body. If, if I could, can you just supplement that? So that you would agree then that the importance here is is outreach and going out into into the communities to to to, to seek out. Those who may be mm -hmm. uh, in an environment where uh, uh, hepatitis C is, is, is a danger. So, I would imagine programmes like the, the Needle Exchange Programme, as, you, as you've already indicated, and I wonder whether or not there's a pattern there where you know, the Needle Exchange Programmes are, are, are more prevalent 
and then, then, and then others. Um, I was I was very much struck by uh, the, the idea of peer to peer. It's a much stronger and uh, stronger way of, of bringing people uh, in, in for testing because of course we have to overcome the, the stigma as well. And uh, I, I wonder what work has been done within that peer to peer or, or within the prison uh, population or, or the third sector organisations sort of out with a clinical a clinical environment which perhaps. Uh, uh, the people in the more uh, periphery of society would be more comfortable engaging with. Uh, I've worked as a peer with the, Hep with the Hep C Trust for a while, so maybe Charles would be in a better position to say about your peer, the peer programme that you that he's run. I mean, <coughs> thank you, and thank you for your um, uh, intervention yesterday in the debate. Um, the, certainly, we're great believers in, in a peer approach, and... Um, we have done less in Scotland than we've done in England, but there is some good work going on. Uh, Waverley Care are doing some good work uh, in prisons. Uh, we've just been asked by the uh, Health and Justice, NHS Health and Justice in England, to find and train peers in every English prison, uh, which will happen over the next two years. There is a huge amount of stigma in prisons that we think the peer program is probably the only way of overcoming. Um, I was just talking to someone yesterday um, who the, they organized a, a meeting in Wandsworth. Nobody turned up because nobody wanted to be seen to be going to that meeting and admitting they had hepatitis C. So it's a big issue and that stops then people talking about it, sharing correct information and making sure that people are supported into testing and, and treatment but also it's not just prisons clearly it's out in the community and we would like to see peer programs in in all of the drug services and many drug services have volunteer programs as part of um, their recovery and upskilling people about hepatitis c and turning them into peers there is an extra string to their bow and a really useful way of giving people self-esteem and helping them by um, helping other people. And what we've really found is that peer programs help the peers as much as they do the people they're helping. Um, and we would like to see this across Scotland as a model of doing this because it will become increasingly difficult to engage with people as we start curing the easier people to engage with, it will be the more chaotic people who are left that we need to find. So I completely agree that this is the way we need to go. Michelle Ballantyne. Right, thank you. Good morning, Charles and Jim. Um, I want to just explore with you a bit about, you've talked a little bit about how people come into services and my understanding, I used to head up a drug and alcohol service and, you know, bloodborne virus testing was really a core part of what we were delivering and particularly through the needle exchange, as you said. Um, and obviously once we, we've tested some I'm slightly concerned, but I'm very concerned about the concept that we test, find out that they've got it and then block treatment because, because that would beg quite a lot of questions. Um, but you also talked about the fact that besides those who we never get to diagnose for whatever reason, those who've been diagnosed are then not in touch with services. You know, like we're just letting them walk out the door again and losing them. So could you tell us a little bit about why you think that's happening, why they're not maintaining contact with services, and also about that range of services that might be available? Because I have a sense on the ground that we're losing a lot of services at the moment. So we're actually getting thinner on the ground rather than enhancing. I'd just like to know what your view is on that. Uh, I, I work in drug services at the moment uh, as a, a trainee in the AWTP, the SDF, and uh, I find that a lot of the people that, that, that come along, they maybe be scared that they'll be on, they'll be on prescriptions so, and they might be act, still using drugs. So they'll be scared to test or to have drug to blood test taken and stuff like that in case they get the prescription stopped, basically. Uh, that's one thing, I suppose it's, that's one of the main things. There's other people, another group of people who maybe have collapsed veins, so they'll be scared of going to the nurses for blood tests because they, you know, they don't want to 
to go through that kind of experience. So I think that's quite a lot of that is to blame that kind of that kind of problem really. Yeah. Mm. Can I add to that? Oh, sorry, no, good, Jim. There's also uh, a lack of education on the, on the new drugs. A lot of people are aware that there are new drugs out there, but they're not aware how effective they are and how little side effects there are. So they're still thinking back to the, the old days with interferon and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. And I think that, that um, you know, people have been being diagnosed since 1991. And clearly, if they were diagnosed in the first 10 years, treatment was not just awful, but, but ineffective. And either people tried it and it didn't work, or they didn't want to try it. And so they drifted away from services. More recently, as Jim said, the, the, um, this idea that, first of all, you're going to have to have a biopsy if you're going to do treatment. Secondly, that treatment was horrible. And thirdly, that probably because you were using drugs, nobody would give you the treatment anyway. And I think that that has still persisted with the new drugs because there's been this big hoo-ha generally in the press about how incredibly expensive they are. And certainly some of our experience is that people who are injecting drugs don't feel that the system cares for them and therefore they don't think that they're sort of going to get something that's unbelievably expensive, not that they are, but... Um, and then clearly amongst this group of people and you know i know from my personal experience very often people in, inject drugs get kicked around by the system or certainly they feel they're being kicked around by the system and at the end of the day they end up thinking i don't really deserve this because they get into a mindset where they sort of feel that what's happening to them is in some way deserved which is terrible um and that is one of the things that treatment reverses. It's by saying to people, no, 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 you are worth being cured. We do value you. And that is an extremely important message to this group of people. Can, can I follow up? In terms of that, you know, w w when you connect people, do you think we've got it right at the moment in terms of the understanding of hepatitis? Are people engaged with that? Because a lot of work was done around actually I suppose, getting people to understand that hepatitis was there, that it could be cured? Or do you think we've missed that message? I think there's still need to do, we still need to do more work on the, the, the way it's transmitted, past getting the message out the way it's transmitted, because, you know, some people maybe feel that they've only used drugs once, and that was 20-odd years ago, so it, it, won't be, it won't have affected them. But it, it can have, you know, and... Uh, yeah, we need to get the, the education out there just to let people know that there are other ways it can be transmitted. It can be transmitted through hairdressers, piercings, tattoos, things like that. So if we make people aware of the risks, then they'll be in a better position to, to understand if they've been at risk or not, and then test. Right. And in terms of the range of services, I asked the question at the end, my sense was that it seems you know to have got smaller, less access, if you like. It's my sense, right or wrong, from your position on the ground. I mean, if, if if you want to go and get checked, if you want to try and access treatment, is there a range of services that you can go to now or are the pathways limited? Most health boards have their sexual health and bloodborne virus oh. departments that, 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 will mm. do, that, will, that will deal with them. I think, that, that I think in, in some areas the services are, are very good, but I think that certainly drug services are under a lot of yeah. pressure. And therefore, how much time a, a key worker has with someone to actually talk about hepatitis C on top of their other, what appear to be more pressing issues. And of course, if you have advanced liver disease and are in danger of developing liver cancer, there may not be anything actually more pressing. Um, but so I, I don't think we're fully ramped up to do the outreach we need to do. So I think that there's still quite a lot of service development that needs to happen two stages getting people engaged is an issue and having that outreach thing and then having engaged them tested them diagnosed them then there seems to be a blockage to treatment yeah. but we need to the answer is we need to take the, the treatment as close as possible to where we're diagnosing yes them. i mean ideally you would be in a position to test somebody and know the answer that day to whether they have it there are point of care 
test for the virus itself and have them start treatment that day. That's what we should be aiming for. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, Camilla. You, you may have, have covered this partially, but um, going back to um, hepatitis C being preventable and treatable, you've mentioned work ongoing in prisons uh, and your wish to see more uh, peer programmes um, being developed, but c can I ask what other efforts um, do you understand have been put into targeting people who are at a, a higher risk of infection and how resources split uh, between prevention of infection and diagnosis or treatment uh, of people who uh, may already be infected? That's a difficult question. <laughs> Our resources are split. I think, you know, given that this is largely sort of health board driven. Um, but clearly the, the prevention side of it has two real parts. Uh, one is around uh, needle exchange, um, opiate substitution therapy, harm reduction generally. And, and clearly there's a discussion at the moment about safe consumption rooms, for example. And then there's treatment as prevention, uh, where you treat people and they then cannot transmit because they've been cured. Um, so um, I, I don't know how the, the, the resources are split. I think that um, there is probably, there's probably quite a squeeze on the prevention, the sort of primary prevention side, just because drug services tend to be under a lot of, a lot of pressure at the moment. Uh, financially, and there will be a, uh, a temptation to cut because clearly, if you're talking about needle and syringe uh, programs, um, the the level of coverage uh, in terms of how many needles and syringes you make available, and where you have it, their opening times, their convenience for people, all make a big difference. Um, and sorry, I've forgotten the first bit of your question. Um, well, with regard to uh, targeting people who are at higher risk. Yes. So um, we don't, as far as I'm aware, have an official opt-out testing policy in prison. But that's what we should have. So everyone who goes into prison should be automatically tested for bloodborne viruses unless they don't wish to be tested. Same should happen in, in drug services, and I think it pretty much broadly is. But it needs to be it needs to be absolutely clear this has to happen. And then what we need to do is to look back in drug services through records for people who've been tested but never linked into services. Um, and we need to look at our South Asian community. Pakistan happens to be a country that has very lax health care and tremendous overuse of injections delivered by quasi-medical staff for just about anything, uh, mild analgesics, um, with uh, reused syringes. And so um, certainly some of our Pakistani community are at higher risk and we need to make sure that we use community centres, mosques and so on to get the message out there and provide the testing. Um, and clearly um, where you have homeless populations, homeless health needs to be responsible for making sure that they are tested too. So there is a lot going on but we need to do more of it, and we particularly need to concentrate on this group of people who've never been diagnosed. Um, and it is, we haven't probably done enough around awareness. And I, I noticed the minister's response yesterday saying that um, the, the government is actually looking at uh, a public awareness campaign. Because the problem about awareness campaigns is that what we've tended to do is do something on World Hepatitis Day and then do nothing for a year and wait till it comes around again. I'm afraid it's the... Um, Anita Roddick, who, as you know, was diagnosed um, with hepatitis C um, 25 years after she contracted it through giving birth, said, um, when you're doing awareness, you need to just keep banging away at the same message and, until people are literally fed up of hearing it. Then you get something to happen. Okay. 
That's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Whittle. Welcome to politics. Um, <laughs> from, the, from, from the information that was provided to us, uh, the October 2017 report of the treatment and therapy subgroup that you referred to in the petition is not yet in the public domain. It's understood that the Minister for Public Health has stated the recommendations of that subgroup would be used to inform an elimination plan to be published this year. Have you any indication of when this elimination plan may be due to be published? The initial indication was that it would be on World Hepatitis Day, but that seems to have wobbled, if that's a correct expression. Okay. I can see a question going. <laughs> Okay, then any final questions? No, in that case, um, we now have to think about <clears throat> any comments or suggestions for action. I think there's been a lot um, of evidence there, and I think I particularly want to thank the petitioner because I think the message very strongly is this is curable and it transforms lives. There is no stronger message than that. And I think the related issue for me is around aspiration. If we're simply seeing a fall in the cost of drugs, effective treatment, just maintaining, keeping the same number of people rather than use, using that as an opportunity. I think that's something we would want to to raise with the, the Scottish Government. Brian? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think again, thank, thank the petitioners for bringing this. And I think what yesterday's debate highlighted to me is that, that rarely uh, we have an opportunity here to eliminate a disease. Uh, and that, that is, that is uh, to me, a, a, an opportunity I think we must grasp. And I think... You know, the other thing is, we, you know, we, you know, we know where to look for those who are, are undiagnosed, and uh, you know, I, I would like to, you know, out, out the back of yesterday, I think that the, the the minister was very positive about what she wanted to do. She wanted to look at the the the, the example of Tayside, um, and and see whether that can be rolled out across the country. And because of that, I, I would actually quite like to write to the Scottish Government uh, and ask for the views and the actions in the plan, and just to reiterate in writing uh, what the Minister uh, basically, I thought, uh, committed to yesterday, which was, 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 was a very good debate. So I think we should write to the Scottish Government and see if we can get that commitment uh, in writing to the Petitions Committee. OK. Anything else? I think we should write to the health boards and, and ask this question about treatment. Um, so let's find out what their approach is taken to treating individuals, times, any con you know, budget constraints. Um, I also think we should write to the ADPs, the Alcohol and Drug Partnerships, and ask their views on the petition, um, because they're in the front line of, of a lot of this decision around purple viruses, etc. So they should give us a fairly good picture of what's going on in each area. I think in writing to the health boards, we want specifically to ask them whether the, there is a correlation between the the drop in uh, the cost of drugs and an increase in the number of people that have been treated. Yeah. Because, you know, I know you use the term pocket the money, but clearly they may be diverting it to other pressures. Yeah. And you can understand they're, they're um, ma making that <coughs> choice, but I think we want to illuminate that choice into saying, well, actually, there is a, there's a huge gain here from that hepatitis C sufferers are not benefiting from the fall in the cost of the drug, which you would have hoped you would have done. Board letter should be a series of very closed questions that we want specific answers to. The ADP one should be a much more open one. You know, tell us about what's going on, how you're feeling about it, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Another suggestion is writing to the Scottish Prison Service and ask them what their understanding is. Would they, would they welcome an opt-out system rather than opt-in? And to what extent they see that? And even whether they have a view on this peer-to-peer -peer work that has been highlighted as well? In, in saying that the Scottish Prison Service now contract their drug and alcohol work, they've got people, they've got, um, I'm not sure which company holds the contract at the moment, but it's actually contracted. We can, so, we can find that mm. out. We can ask that question. Mm. 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 Drug nurses and things. Okay. I, mean, I think we're keen to, to pursue this petition further. I think there's some very interesting information being highlighted today, and it's clearly something the Scottish Government has exercised about as well. And there was, I think certainly my, the reports I received was that I was unable to be there, that it was a very positive debate. So we would want um, that to, to be agreed. So we're going to write to the Scottish Government, the APDs, as has been said, ADPs, um, and to the health boards, ask this question about the impact of the, the, the reduction in costs and maybe other issues around how do they get the balance right between 
Thank you, question. Angus asked about the balance between prevention and identification and treatment is an, an important one as well. So if that's agreed, can I thank the petitioners very much for coming along today. I think what was a very useful session. Once we have the evidence and responses back, you'll have a further opportunity to comment on those submissions and we, can, we will obviously it'll come back to a session of the committee at a later stage in the year. And thank you for that. And can we suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave? Meeting back to order, and we now move to the next petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1684 on the composition of local authority executive committees. This is a new petition submitted by James Swan on behalf of Whitburn and District Community Council. It calls on the Scottish Government to amend the Local Government Scotland Act 2004 to require that the composition of the executive body must reflect the political party membership of those elected. The background information to the petition states that the petitioners feel that Executive committees or similar governing bodies in charge of local authorities' policies and budgets do not always reflect the electorate's votes in terms of composition and believe that a power-sharing arrangement would be a more practical method of creating consensus decisions. They suggest that single transferable vote system does not work as intended. The note prepared jointly by the clerk and Spice explains that there is no statutory guidance which sets out how a local authority must form its administration which is in line with the Scottish Government's approach of allowing local authorities to self-govern. It notes that a number of local authorities have altered their decision-making structures in recent years. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Um, <laughs> yes, having, having been a local councillor, um, very much the local councils do um, form their own <laughs> scheme of administration that decides on committee structure, membership, etc. Um, I would be very reluctant to see it legislated for at the top. Um, I think it's actually quite important that councils can flex to meet what they perceive as the needs of their local community. And it does vary. Some of them do have um, committees that do reflect political structure. In fact, most of the committees do. Um, but the executive often doesn't. Um, and I think that is not inappropriate at times. Um, but I think it's important that local government have the say in how they do it and the electorate can vote them out if they don't like what the decision they've made. So, I wouldn't All support right. this I would, act. Yeah, I would, mm -hmm. I would agree with Michelle, really, I don't think legislation is that the road we would want to go down because, um, well, it just reduces the um, local authorities' um, ability to, to self-govern. So mm. I don't think we should be doing that. Angus? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Well, I have to say this is an issue which has been raised in my neck of the woods um, and remains a, a hot topic, mm -hmm. uh, causing much angst uh, between the political parties on, on the local authority. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's any harm in uh, uh, asking the Scottish Government um, what their view is on the petition, but I think we already know yeah. what the answer is going to be. <laughs> so... Um, but, you, Sorry, you but I think um, you know. I don't think. I don't think we should um, close the petition. I, I think we should still contact the, the Scottish government. I wonder if it would be worthwhile contacting local authorities as well. I mean, I think that there is a sense. I mean, I don't know the detail behind this petition, but that the idea of <clears throat> a single transferable vote system was that the decisions would be made in a more inclusive way. And people then feel they're excluded when it comes to decisions at a local level. But um, there's a number of challenges in all of that. But my instinct would be not to want to see the Scottish Government um, imposing a set of rules. But I think we also want to reflect on what is it that's really motivated the petition. And so it would be useful to 
um, get a response from Scottish Government and local authorities, and then that would afford the petitioner an opportunity maybe to further clarify their views in response to the responses we've received. So I wonder if it's agreed then that we can um, agree to seek the views of the Scottish Government and local authorities on the action called for in the petition. If that's agreed, we can then move on <coughs> to which the next petition for consideration today is Petition 1686 on Homelessness Crisis in Scotland, submitted by Sean Clarkin. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to front load £40 million of the £50 million pounds in its Ending Homelessness Together Fund to be used in the next year as part of an expanded Housing First approach. The SPICE briefing explains that the Ending Homelessness Together Fund was announced in September 2017 and is intended to support recommendations from the Homelessness and Rough Sleepers Action Group, chaired by John Sparks, Chief Executive of Crisis. Members will also note that the Local Government and Communities Committee has recently undertaken work on homelessness. Among other points, that committee recommended the implementation of a Housing First policy in Scotland. In its response to the committee, the Government sets out that it has accepted in principle recommendations from the Homelessness and Rough Sleepers Action Group in relation to rapid rehousing and the Housing First approach. The Government considers that work to be undertaken in that respect will cover the actions called for the Local Government and Communities Committee. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I, 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 think it's, I mean, I think it's a very interesting, mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting petition, and I think, um, you know, given the fact that you know the, mon the money's there, the policy's there, um, I think we should ask for views from the government mm -hmm. um, and, and all interested stakeholders. You know, shelter, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, COSLA, to find out what they think. Um, it's, it's, it's a suggestion that should be put put forward, I think. Angus? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, clearly, I'd, I'm sure the Scottish Government would, if they could, um, front load uh, the funding, but I'd be keen to hear the reasoning why it can't, if, if that's the case. Um, clearly, if it can, then why not? Yeah. Yeah. Brian? Yeah, I, th I think that... Uh, as I say, but this is a really interesting one. I think in, in situations like this, if you could, you would front load it. It makes perfect sense mm -hmm. to do that. And I say, I, I, I give colleague Angus MacDonald here, I'd like to ask the Scottish Government whether it, it can. Uh, and if it, if it can, uh, whether it will. I think that seems a very reasonable question to ask. I think some of the work of the of the action group was to address the immediacy of the problem of homelessness in, in winter. And it may be that we're very practical, reasonable things that had to be done in the short term while you're developing a broader policy. And I think they're doing that. And I'm, I was very struck by the fact that the Local Government Communities Committee um, had taken such an interest in this Housing First proposal. I suppose it, it seems an obvious thing to do. One might ask why it's not been done before, because I think around homelessness, there is a kind of a desire across the board for people to try and, and address that. So these are questions I think that we can flag up to the Scottish Government. Um, and I think Rona's right to suggest um, different stakeholders as well, um, and as she's identified. Is there anything else? Michelle? Homelessness is a far more complicated problem than it first appears, I think. Um, and I know, having, having tried to deal with it a few years back, it's, it is. So I think it is important that we hear what everybody's got to say first. Um, before we take it any further and, and do as Rona said, and write to everybody and find out what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so we, we recognise the importance of this petition, the whole challenge of homelessness and the need to address the vulnerabilities of people who are homeless. Um, and we recognise that work has been, is being done by the Scottish Government through, in particular, the Homeless and Rough Sleepers Action Group. But we would want to know... Um, about their views, specifically in the petition, how you might direct resources to this um, approach, which I think there seems to be certainly a view that it, it would help the, the challenge that people are facing. So is that agreed? Okay. okay, in that case, if we can move on to the final new petition for consideration today, which is petition 1687 on the regulation of fireworks displays in Scotland. This petition was submitted by Jane Erskine and calls for a review of existing regulations governing firework displays in Scotland to protect animals from fear and distress. From the background information to the petition, one of the petitioner's principal concerns appears to be around who is responsible for enforcing the regulations under relevant legislation. 
and the SPICE briefing provides information on the Fireworks Scotland Regulations 2004, including the different categories of fireworks and curfews to which they are subject. The briefing also discusses the issues identified with the petitioner in terms of responsibility under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006, and notes that as recently as October 2017, the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform stated that the Scottish Government has no plans to review existing regulations in this area. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I have some empathy with this after um, a neighbour decided to have a huge firework display right over the top of my horses and sent them into absolute panic and they went through a fence. So, uh, you know, this is this is something that I think we need to ask some questions on because on the whole, less and less people now let off personal fireworks, it appears to me, compared to when I was young. Um, but, you know, how we regulate them and how we make sure that people act sensibly with them, I think is still an issue and perhaps, you know, something that we should seek the, the views of the Scottish Government and the UK Government on what's being asked for in the petition. It is important. Mm. Okay. I, don't know. I, think, um, I think it's particularly well, complicated in the sense mm -hmm. that the sale of fireworks is, is a reserved matter, so that, that does complicate the issue. I've got huge sympathy with this um, petition. Um, uh, I, I don't like um, fireworks unless it's in an organised display. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we, yes, we should, we should um, seek the views of the, the Scottish and UK government, but I fear that it's complicated because of the... Um, the split nature of it, the licensing and the reserved um, uh, matter for the sale of, of fireworks. Okay, Angus. Yeah, thanks, Camilla. I'd certainly agree um, with Rona McKay and, and, and Michelle Valentine that I, I've got uh, a lot of sympathy with this petition. It's had a reoccurring issue uh, with my casework, uh, and I'm sure every other MSPs. Um, however, the, as, as already said, the, there's clearly been an issue with addressing it properly because uh, it's a reserved issue, uh, because it's regarded as a consumer safety issue. Uh, although um, the 2004 Scottish regulations did introduce a curfew, which I suppose has, has helped a bit, but um, there's st still room for improvement. So um, I'd certainly be keen to seek the Scottish Government's views okay. uh, and the UK Government's yeah. views. Brian? I think, yeah. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of personal responsibility involved in letting fireworks having done it I have to say in um, <laughs> my back garden for the for the street once um, but what you do is you 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 know responsibility would suggest that you go around all your neighbours especially the ones who have pets and make sure they, they know what's going on what time it's going on so I think people are obviously not doing that I'm not doing making that approach and I just wonder what kind of legislative you know ability we have in here to make that make that change um, but uh, I certainly be, I agree with uh, Angus McDonald that uh, we should write to the Scottish Government and see the views on this. I actually was very involved around the debate around, showed my age, the Fireworks Re Scotland regulations in 2004 and it came out of, it wasn't so much thoughtlessness and about pets, it was a, it was a form of antisocial behaviour which was intimidating people within communities. My sense is that that calmed down for a long period of time, I'm not sure whether it's um, as a uh, I've certainly not picked up as much um, issues around it now as there was in the past, but at one point it was it was it was horrific, and I think the question of uh, the question to ask is how do you manage the, the purchase of fireworks with the, I mean really 2004 was kind of pre-online buying, so the extent to which you can manage that I think that's an important question, and my own sense is the extent to which at that time there was a desire to move people towards more public displays and, and the safety element for, for, for children and so on. It'd be interesting to know um, to what extent, you know, and I think there's some reference to it in our papers about it, is it instance of um, accidents and so on, whether they've gone up or down and, and just kind of uh, featured that as well. So I think we are agreeing that we would write to the Scottish Government and the UK Government on the action called for in the petition and recognising there are competing interests here, I think, that people who like the idea of a firework display now, sometimes you get them at weddings in a way they wouldn't have done in the past, against pet owners who think, well, any form of, of firework display is really frightening for a, or can be very frightening for animals. Yeah, 
always broken. You know, no one sticks to them, so you can get far. You know, where I live, fireworks can go off at midnight and, and after. Yeah. You know, so, um, is there any way that that could be tightened up to, to, to regulate it's, that better? I suppose it, it's one thing regulation, other thing's enforcement. Yeah. You know, whether exactly. you know, when it's true around a lot of the antisocial behaviour, low level antisocial behaviour, noise and so on, absolutely the question is the amount of resources you're able to invest and yep. get somebody to go and check things out. I think. J just as, as a matter of um, point, I suppose, really, this petition is, is focuses on animals in rural areas. Um, so that, you know, that's what they're looking at, which is really about, you know, what happens to all those those animals, particularly that are in fields, mm -hmm. that suddenly find fireworks breaking over the top of them, mm -hmm. which is, is and, it, and it can send flocks of sheep and cows and everything into apoplexy, you know, they're mm -hmm. charging across the field and horses particularly mm -hmm. can go berserk okay. um, and, and, you know, subsequent yeah. injury can be quite significant. So um, I think those are two different things compared to, say, the impacts, you know, yes, yeah. you, your dogs will be frightened, but but quite yeah. often in the house you tend to be with them or it's whatever, issue, but, it, yeah. but it is those yeah. particular those animals that are out in the open that find... Yeah. Okay. And they so may be unattended as well, so there's nobody there to yeah. reassure them. Mm -hmm. So we're agreeing to seek the views of the Scottish Government and the UK Government on the action called for in the petition, and that will afford the petitioner a uh, further opportunity to respond when we receive those submissions. So we can thank you for that, and this and now close the, the public session of this committee and move into private session. <laughs>